Pay attention. <laughs> Welcome to Straight Talk. You can PT me today. A young woman from Adelaide, not from Sydney, two normal parents, a normal person has done something quite superhuman. She is the social media fitness sensation. With Kayla Itzinas. Founder of the Sweat Training app. I believe they sold it for $400 million. It was just like the other day I like stood back and I was like, Wow, I'm actually really proud of myself. Like, I created this community of women. Someone said to me one day, Kayla, if you didn't have what you had, what would you be? I was like, oh, I just thought it was the easiest question in the world. I was like, oh, personal trainer? No, 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 like, you lost everything. I'm like, yeah, a personal trainer. I'll be honest, like, the last seven years, the, the whole rise of Kayla was really hard. Not being anyone, to suddenly having my face, you know, in the media. So if Nike does something wrong, it's Nike. It's not a person. But when Kayla Atzinas does something wrong, it's Kayla Atzinas' fault and it's her name. Why do you worry so much about it being misrepresented or not represented in the way that you have sort of outlined? I was hesitant to say anything. Why didn't you become the CEO? I think that for a long time it was just, um, how do I do this? Kayla. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> Welcome to Straight Talk. You, you can PT me today. <laughs> How you going, all right? Yeah, good. So, uh, yeah, you know, like many years ago, uh, probably, I don't know, maybe, how old is your daughter now? Four. Four. Okay. I think it was like three and a half years ago. I tried to get you on to the, the show um, when I was in the city, in the studios in the city, and um, you couldn't make it because you were heavily pregnant at the time, as I said and recall. Um, so, and, uh, yeah, actually we ended up getting Toby on the show, but, <laughs> <laughs> but lots happened since then between you and Toby. But, uh, so, but, but we're here to talk to you. And I always wanted to talk to you. I, I always wanted to meet you for a whole number of reasons. Um, you know, we all think that, uh, we're patrioti. We're all you know, somehow related to each other. We were just talking about it earlier. Greeks to Greeks, you know, like, uh, I always get intrigued, especially a young girl from Adelaide who's done so well for herself. You've Thank killed you. it, like Thank seriously you so killed much. it. And, um, and it's not just the, the metrics and it's not just the numbers that, you know, everyone keeps talking about, you know, it's all over Wikipedia and everywhere else when you do your research, when I do my research, you know, the numbers of people who follow you and the amount of money you sold the business for, all that sort of stuff. Not really just about that from my point of view. What it's about for me is a young woman from Adelaide, not from Sydney, not from one of the fancy schools here in Sydney, but a young girl from Adelaide with two normal parents who's a normal person has done something quite superhuman for me. You cracked That's it. That's so nice. You killed it. Like it's a big deal. Yeah. And you've always remained, at least from what I'm seeing, from where I'm looking, grounded um, and uh, well-managed and uh, reserved and haven't tried to make a big deal of it, even though it is a massive deal from where I'm sitting. Like... You know, women very rarely get to do what or achieve what you achieved, especially from a little town like Adelaide. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Thank you. How do you feel about that? I I think I made the mistake early on of never, ever accepting compliments like that, never, ever celebrating anything like that. And when people used to say, you know, you've done really well, like, how do you feel? I'm like, good, good. Like, I used to kind of try brush it off. But it was just like the other day I, like, stood back and I was like, wow, I'm actually really proud of myself. Like, I'm really proud. I sent Jay a message, my fiance. I said, I'm really proud of myself, weirdly. It's like, it's like, like a weird thing to say. He's, he wrote back, you should be. I was like, yeah, it's, 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 it's like incredible. It's sort of a delayed response. Yeah. Like, is, is that because Kayla growing up was always told to know her place or is it, are your parents humble people or what, what, where does that come from? So my, uh, my mum, I'll just talk about the women on my side, my sister, like if you need an arm, we'll cut off our arm and give it to you. Like that's just us. So I watched my Yaya work so hard. Like she ran a household and I know that doesn't seem like much now, but like every single meal is cooked, homegrown, like the house is clean. So there's no cleaners. There's no dishwasher. Like she is the dishwasher. Like that's what my grandpa says to her. <laughs> you are the dishwasher. So it sounds terrible, but like I just, I'm just around hard working women with a lot of love. So when people say to me like, oh, you know, they talk about money or oh, you've made so much money. How do you feel? I'm like, uh, not really like a question that I, or something that I really like to talk about. I talk about my family um, or the love that we have. That's just what I've grew up with. I just don't really know that. That business talk. Yeah, well, it's it's. Do you, I I remember the day that I did my deal 
uh, and many years ago in 2004 and uh, I was sitting in New York when I did it and I was just there by myself and the way I celebrated I just went and bought myself a pizza. I got the concierge in the hotel and I stayed at a really fancy hotel. I'd never seen anything, anything like that before in my life and I got the concierge in the hotel at 11 o'clock at night to get me a pizza um, because I was in New York so I thought I'm going to celebrate a pizza and a beer and uh, people sort of think, I, I'm sure they think, oh, yeah, what a lot of bullshit but I wasn't overwhelmed um, on that day. I was, in fact, when I think back at it, I was a little bit underwhelmed. It took me a long time to sort of grow into it. Is that sort of what's happened to you? Have you taken a long time to grow into it, like uh, to get that sense, well, I did something pretty good, you know, pretty big deal? A hundred percent. I had no idea how to celebrate that. Like I just, I remember sitting down at the table and the deal was done and um I just didn't know how to tell my family. We're all sitting around the dinner table. We were all having a dinner. Everyone was laughing. Everyone was doing normal. And I was sitting there thinking, when do I tell them? Like, so then I went, so I went out that day and I bought my family gifts, like just like really small things, things that they wanted. And I gave it to them at the dinner table. Everyone's like, why are we opening these presents? Like, why are you doing this? And I was like, I thought, man, this is so lame. Like, I just, just say it. And mom's like, did the deal go through? And I was like, yeah. She's like, oh my God. Like, congratulations. I was like, this is, this is so weird. Like that was it that, and, and it was done. Like I just didn't know. I'm just not that person that will like scream about it and like cheer and throw a big party. It wasn't me. It's just like that. I was happy. I was at the dinner table with my family and that was it. But, but at what point in time do you say, okay, I'm going to go spend some of the money. I'm going to go buy something I've always wanted to buy that I could never afford before. I couldn't justify buying. At what point did you do, did, did you do it at all? And if, if so, at what point? So the first, this was actually prior to, like we're talking about the sale of sweat. This is prior yep. to this. This is the first money that ever came in through the PDFs. I was like so excited. I used to dream about this. So my brain goes really fast. I'm a backtrack. My brain goes really fast. Ever since I was a kid, the only way I can put myself to sleep is to think of like imaginary situations where something really good would happen and I would just keep thinking about it, keep thinking about it. I always just think, I want to buy my uncle a car and a shed for him to fix up his car. This was me. I grew up with no money, so this is just me. Um, I want to I want to pay off my parents' house. I want to buy my, buy my dad a car and buy my mum a car because my mum drove around in this car. This just, mum, I won't embarrass you if you're listening to this, but it was not the greatest car. Like it would break down. It was horrible. Anyway, and so the day that we made money from the PDFs, I paid off my parents' house. It was like my dream came true. And my, my parents didn't know how to act. I wrote it in a Christmas card to them. They, I like, I was like, read it out loud. And they're like, they read it out. And my dad's face was just like, like, and I, I could see he's never cries. I could see this tiny little tear wiped away this tear and it was just like, thank you. Like, I don't know what to say. Like, I'm meant to help you. Like, I'm your parent. Like, I'm meant to help you and you're helping us. Like, thank you so much. I was like, day made. That was it. That was my that was my splurge of money. That was it. <laughs> and it's funny that you should say that because sometimes the biggest deal is not that you've all of a sudden got money you've got access to, but the biggest deal is what you can do for other people. And that's, 100%. That is the biggest deal. 100%. Just seeing my grand, even my young bubble, like they never bought anything for themselves. And I went to Spotlight of all places. It's like I bought them a tablecloth that they can wipe down because they used to have to change the tablecloth because they have so many people over for coffees and stuff. So I bought this tablecloth that kind of looks like concrete they could wipe down. It was like $70 a square meter. They would never pay this money for this tablecloth. They, they've still got it to this day, 10 years later, on the table. They love it. Like those little things, it's like money gives you freedom. And happiness if you've got the right people around you to do things for them, to make them smile. Like I love that. Like I said, I'll cut off my arm and give it to you if you need it. Yeah, that's a that's my. If you if I just ask you just to cast your mind back to the time, if you could give me an age, the time when you first thought about establishing an app called Sweat, can you take your mind back to that date, that period? All I remember is being young, releasing the PDFs, and the only reason that the app was even considered was because other community, the, our community members were saying we want, because we used to say we're like a personal trainer in your pocket. They're like literally do it, like do an app, do an app, do an app, do an app. But no one in the fitness industry, especially in the women's space, had done an app. So when we transitioned to an app, we were like, yay, this is what you wanted. And they were like, no effing way are we paying $3 a week, $3.99 a week, for an app, that's so expensive. That's too much. Like imagine, imagine that we all we have subscriptions now for everything. But at the time, 
was way too much. So there was thousands and thousands of complaints. The app wasn't ready to be held by thousands and thousands of people. So it crashed. Like everything went wrong. So in that time, I can't, like, it's almost like I've erased it from my brain because it was so scary at the time. I was like, I'm giving you what you want. And then bang, complaints, like, or bang, like not ready enough. I was like, oh, I just want this to work. I just want everyone to be happy. <laughs> Such a people pleaser. This is my problem. Um, so I just remember being young and trying to service an audience. But did that dent your enthusiasm? Like how do you respond? From, how do you react yes. and recover from that? Yes, because it's different when if you have a brand. If you have a brand, let's let's say Nike. Who owns Nike? 99.9% of people will have absolutely no, no idea. So if Nike does something wrong, it's Nike. It's not a person. But when Kayla Atzinas does something wrong, it's Kayla Atzinas' fault and it's her name and it's her face that gets plastered everywhere and it's her that people are angry at. It's not... It wasn't sweat. It was sweat with Kayla. That's what the brand was yep. first. And it was me. So all I saw was my face in the news, my name. It was in the news? Oh, of course it was. Compliant. Because you're charging three ninety nine. No, no. It was It was the fact that the app crashed and so many people wanted to get on it and we couldn't service those people. So it almost felt like at that moment you're like, did we just fail? Like, is this all over? Is it game over? And it was my face. And it's still to this day, no matter what, it's always me. Even if it's not me, it's always my face. So it's really hard having that brand. So, so what did you do though? Like, so when you we fixed like, it. <laughs> yeah, no, but 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 how did you go about fixing it? So, like, what was the process? Did you have to call in a whole lot of um, tech heads to come in and sort, yep. of sort this shit out? Then yep. have to allocate dough to it. Yeah. And my probably my biggest question is, how did you fund that? Um, at the time, actually, I have absolutely no idea. I, no, no, I do have an idea. It's that we've kind of erased it from our brain. So it was launch, press launch, and just being not ready. We had a dev team, which was building the app. And it was like, we were on the other side of the world. And it was like trying to wake everyone up, trying to get everyone up. Like, guys, like this is crashed. Isn't like, don't worry, it's under control within 24 hours. Um, and with the help of Toby. Um, and he's just waking everyone up um we got it fixed but in that 24 hour period it was like if it was a ding noise it would have just gone ding 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 ding, and it was all just my app has crashed I can't get on I can't log in like I did and why is it 3.99 per week like I don't want to pay for this I pay too much it was so much just as a kid um but we got it fixed it sounds hectic but yeah it was so how important is it do you think for me, it's really important, but how important is it for you in your case that you have a partner in those situations, a business partner? I mean, he was your, your partner partner, but but just put that aside. How important is it when you if something goes wrong that you can sort of lean on your partner and say, oh, my God, what have you done here and how are we going to fix it? And I mean, and is that something you would recommend, having a partner going into these environments? Yeah. And you know what? It's really great and it's great when you're when you're actually with that person. It's it's terrible if it's terrible, and it's great if it's great, right? So like you're with this person, and they're your they are they're your partner, like in life. Yep. And they have your best interests, so you know that that person has your best interests. When you have a partner who's like a buddy, or you don't really know them, you can't trust a hundred percent that that person has your best interests. So yes, it's good if it's good, but if it's bad, it can go terribly wrong. Um, I think if you have the right partner. It's great. You mean business partner? Yeah, yeah. But it, and but what are the what would you say are the because you know I've just been talking to a couple of guys who are in business together and they're they're, they're good mates. They always work together and they trust each other. Is the reason why having a good partner or a partner is because you know how someone is likely to react because you've known them for some time? Absolutely. Yeah, that's what it's about. Like knowing their character. Yeah, and knowing and having that partner there, and this is a credit to Toby. Very cool, calm and collected at the time. Very let's fix this. Very let's do this. Like, And there's obviously me who's there. And I, I'm emotional because what's happening is my face is getting run through the media. This looks like a failure on my behalf. And then you have this person who's there who has your best interests, who is your partner, who is there to, and it's very cool, calm and collected and say, let's fix this, which is what you want at the time. People say don't work with your family because emotions can fly and you guys can like be driven apart. But it's really good when you have someone who is so level-headed to say, let's fix this. Once I got my head around after the first hour or two of things breaking, I got my head back around and I was like, okay, cool, calm and collected. Like 
ignore the media, let's just get this fixed. Having those two people there as the rocks for this company, um, which was quite small, but having the rock, these two, I guess, owners of the company be like, it's all right, guys, we're going to get this fixed. That was um, a really good feeling for our, for our staff, for our team. Yeah, well, the staff's an important one. Um, it, but if I could just go back like one step, in terms of having someone cool, calm and collected like Toby was at the time, mm -hmm. On the flip side of it, his face not getting plastered all over the joint. <laughs> what is the downside of being the face of a brand? Because like to build a brand, it's much easier, well, maybe quicker, if you let the brand borrow your face yeah. and borrow who you are. Because brands need personalities. Well, the, a personality makes it grow quicker if they if people like the personality. But there's a risk associated with it. Did you ever understand the risk associated with being in the front of the sweat with Kayla. Did you understand the, the downside of it or you just said, oh, no, sweet, I'll just go along with it? Listen, so this is what I recommend and this is what I say to people. If you're going to build a brand and it's on you, set specific um, goals, uh, morals, standards, almost like a brand identity. Have that prior to going into your business. And when you go into your business, whatever it is that you do, make sure you stick to those things. So for example, like this is going to sound like a bu bunch of mush until I actually explain it. So I said, I will never sexualize myself to sell a product. Never. You, before you put this your is, name this out is, there. This is before. Yep. This was just me and how I grew up. I will never embarrass my grandparents. I will never, um, probably never train men. I just wanted to focus on women. And at the time it was actually because of religious reasons that I had a lot of female clients and I didn't want to, I loved my, those clients and I respected them. And I was like, you know what guys, I don't actually need to train men. Like, I love you guys. We'll just, let, let's just have women in here. And that's how it started. Um, so there was just like these things, I, these boundaries that I set for myself. So I went in there with a bunch of boundaries and I never broke them. And the fact that I never broke them, I didn't have to worry about the brand getting ruined. Now here's where it gets harder. You start introducing staff, social media teams, marketing teams, brand teams who try to be you. And if you step too far away, then you're actually giving yourself to them and putting your brand, your voice, your face in their hands. And by doing that, that's where the risk comes in. Because if they go and say something, they go and do something, they go and write something that's not you, all the risk falls back on you. So you have to be a control freak. If you're going to put your face that big on your brand, you've got to be a bit of a control freak, which is what I was. I wanted everything done a certain way, which made me quite robotic for a long time because it was to the point where I was like scared that my shoelace would fly off because it would deflect their eye from looking at what I was actually doing. Like everything had to be perfect. No flyaways. No, like, I know it sounds silly, but it's like that helped grow the brand and it kept it clean, kept it pristine. Um, until. I guess it was sold and then you have to step back and accept that. Would you, would you say you, you, you had to become a little bit obsessive about the brand values? And I want to ask you as well on top of that, did you mm. write the brand values down? Like this business about not sexualizing myself, blah, blah, blah. I had to. Was it written down? Yes. And then when you talked to your marketing team or whoever the t people were, they had to they understand knew. that. So you inducted them into this yes. process. Correct. And then do, do you become – do you have to become obsessive? And it doesn't mean – I'm not suggesting you have to become OCD, but do you become obsessed with getting things correct all the time? Yes, you become a control freak. Yeah, that's what you mean by control a freak. Absolutely. Yes, you become a control freak. You want to be able to control every single situation because it is you. It is you. And so when things go on the media and everyone's like, don't worry about it, just ignore it. I'm like, it's not your face. Mm. That's me. So if you write one, one wrong thing – like, I, you know, you step back for two days and you say, look, guys, I trust you. Like, you've got the brand guidelines. You know me. You've been working with me for years. And they go and write one word, just one word. That's me. It's on me. So I'm like, this is why I can never leave. This is why I can never. And this is why I'm still here to today. Like, you sell the business, but you're still in it because you want to be able to control that narrative. Why do you, why do you worry so much about, is it a commercial concern so much about, why do you worry so much about, it being misrepresented or not represented in the way that you have sort of outlined, is that is that for commercial reasons or is, or is that more personal reasons? If, uh, it's it's because, and it sort of sounds a bit backwards, but all I care about is changing your day, making your day better, making you the best version of yourself, making you happy, make sure, like I'm a people pleaser, I just want you to have the best day so I need to have control of that. So for someone to try and be me and try and, 
make your day better by pretending to be me. I don't like that. I don't know what it is about that, but I, I always want to be there. Like I want to be the one to help you. And it was really hard for me. And this is going back, back. It's re- it was really hard for me mentally to move away from one-on-one clients. Cause the narrative is Kayla always said, you know, why would anyone want to train or do a um, BBG, the program, because no one will buy it. It's not that, it's not that I said that it was more the fact that I was like, why would someone want to train without me? I want to physically be there. I want to be able to say, well done. I want to be able to tap them on the back. I want to be able to give them a high five and smile at them and say, see, look, you did it. Why? Like, how could you do that off a piece of paper without me there? But they did. They did it. It was called BBG and it went viral and they absolutely loved it. And I, and I got to stand back and be wrong because I love being wrong. I love when says, someone says you're wrong to me. I'm like, am I? Like, I love that. I love that women did this program. They stood up and they like, didn't need me. They did it by themselves. So that's when I became more controllable of what I was online because I wanted to definitely be always there, always me, always showing up. So someone met me in person, they're like, you're exactly the same. Like that was a compliment to me. So it wasn't, wasn't created. It was you. It's always been me. Like I hope that you, what you see on Instagram, my videos where I'm demonstrating an exercise, you now talking to me now, you're like, you're kind of the same. Like that, that is you. Yes, okay. Maybe I sound a little bit more like I keep saying the word control freak. Um, but I think you would be too when it's your brand. Imagine if an AI model was suddenly just you. It's just not you. It's your voice and I'm just talking. And this AI robot's just pretending be pre- to be pretty cool. It'd be cool. Session. It'd be sick. You'd love it. But you'd also be like, hold on, wait, I didn't really talk like that. Or do I really sound like that? Or did I really want to say that? Like it's almost like someone else controlling you don't like that. In terms of um, how deep you go into that, in terms of your thinking, your process, about how is Kyla represented and the the rules. It's sort of like a rule book. Won't do this, we'll do that, won't do this. Do you go right down to the very detail like like Donald Trump used to do, um, that he never smiles, if you notice, he never smiles. He always wears the same uniform. Um, he carries his hands in the same places. Um, I remember when he came out to Australia once, and we were doing the show and um, he said to me, look, I'll, I'll allow you to do an interview with me. And at the end of the interview, um, he presented himself and we were asked to do, you know, the media wanted us to do some photographs saying you were fired. And uh, every photograph, we took about 30, 40 photographs and we had to approve them before they went out to the media outlets. And uh, in every photograph, my hand was in a different spot. In every photograph he took, his hand was in exactly the same spot. <laughs> and some some of those photographs I smiled, some of those photographs I just say, oh, give a fuck, whatever, you know, just mucking around. His mouth was exactly the same on every one. His hair looked exactly the same. He, it's just like, it was like there was just one one pose he took 50 times with me. It was like they took 50, I did 50 different poses on 50 different occasions. <laughs> so, but, so, but he was very, very particular in relation to how his brand was relative to himself, the media, um, and anyone around him. And I, I, I took that as a lesson and I try to learn from that. Did you go into that level of detail? Like Kayla doesn't smile or Kayla does smile or Kayla doesn't use certain words, she doesn't swear. She Did you go into I that I mean, program? yeah, there was, I mean, okay, so no, not that level of detail. Um, but, you know, like there was other things. So there's my guidelines. So I'll call them my guidelines, which I will not sexualize myself to sell a product. I don't want to embarrass my grandparents. Like, um, I said it before, like I probably, I will never train men. Like, um, there was heaps more. I've written them all down. Um, and, oh, and I will never promote something that I don't believe in. That was like another huge one. And that's why we said no to so many deals. Like everyone's like, oh, we'd love you. To, we'll pay you a million dollars. Say you drink this alcohol brand. I'm like, no, I don't even drink alcohol. Like, I don't care for a million dollars. Like that will ruin me. And just for what, a million dollars? Like, I don't care about that. Um, and that sort of set me apart from a lot of the the rest. And then there's a brand team that comes in and said, also, like, at one point it got crazy. Like, someone came in and said, like, we never wanted to see you in a matching set because that's too influencer. Oh, what's it? A matching set. So, like, if I was to wear red a red sports bra, I can't wear red shorts because that's too influencer and not personal trainer and not um, friendly and not – and they got very much in detail. I was like, oh, okay, this is getting a bit hectic. I just wanted to stick to my guidelines. Yes, I was always warm and friendly, um, but that's just me as a person. Like nothing about this was robotic or fake. It was just what I wanted. And if you are a person who sticks to those guidelines, even in your business, not your business, but anyone listening to this, you feel like you, you feel safe. 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you feel safe within that. Yeah. Well, we we we've had we have brand bibles in in previous businesses, and um, and I try to stick by them. But uh, I always needed someone to sort of say, Mark, stick to the guidelines. I'm a bit opposite to you. Like I would tend to be a bit undisciplined and uh, tend to go outside the guidelines. Sounds like you were more like saying to them, I'm not going outside the guidelines and don't tell me to do that because that's outside my guidelines, your guidelines. Yeah. Um, where the hell does that come from? Like is that your mom, your dad, your grandparents? Like wh- where does that uh, level of awareness and discipline come from? Um, I, I, I have absolutely no idea. It was, I guess it was how I was raised. I've my mum isn't like oh it sounds so weird oh my god my mum listening to this but like hey mum what's like, your mum's what's your mum's name I'm Anna hi Anna <laughs> um Dig like, Anna's Anna. she's, just, <laughs> <laughs> she's just not she's just not like that she's just like so humble she is um she's not loud she's not an attention seeker she's not anything she's very just like a little Greek mum and then my dad is like look I and the thing I always say about my dad is like he's never raised his voice. My dad is the most cool, calm and collected person ever. Like anything goes wrong, I'm like screaming at my sister. She's screaming at me. She stole my toy. She did. My dad would always be like, just be cool, man. Like everyone just calm down, man. Like that's my dad. So like I grew up with that and then I grew up with my grandparents who like they grow their own vegetables. Like I said, like they cook their own meals. Like they don't go anywhere. They don't party. They don't do anything. Like so I grew up just very just like wanting to – I don't know. I don't know how I was raised. It's like you always want to please them. I don't know why. You never want to disappoint them. And I remember when I was like really, really young, it was the first time like you're able to go out to a club and you're able to drink. And like I do not drink alcohol now. I haven't drunk since I was 19, but I did at one time. And I remember I drank and I must have got home really late. And I got up in the morning and I went to go talk to my dad and just the look on his face, I was like, I've disappointed my dad some, somehow. Like, Somehow I just, I never, and it's traumatized me. Like I never want him to look at me like so disappointed like that ever again. And I would hate to think if I wasn't who I was today and I, and I did something else that I didn't believe in, um, that was against my morals, what my family would think of me. And I, I care so much about what they think of me, but then don't care so much about now that I'm saying this, I'm like, do I care what others think, think of me? Like, have I lived my life a certain way that I do care? And maybe yes, but that's who I am. Does that make sense? Like, I don't feel like I've missed out on anything because I've lived my life a certain way. Do you, is it important to worry about what people, other people think though, apart from your family? I think when you run a business, you have a responsibility to, to people to act, say, and do certain things and act, say, not do certain things. Um, for example, like it would be irresponsible of me to do the opposite of what a personal trainer should be. And smoke, drink, take drugs, party. When you're trying to be a role model for others, I think you should live that lifestyle naturally, or, or uh, of or, course, or as in a, a, a performance. No, I think it's. I think the the reason that I am where I will do whatever you want, but the the reason I think I am where I am, um, and currently sitting at what fifteen point nine, say Instagram. Let's use Instagram for for example, followers. Is because I haven't changed because I naturally live my life in a healthy way, balance as well. Like I'm not one of those people that are going to eat a cow salad. Give me a cow salad, I'm going to throw it in the bin. Like I'm going to eat a, like a big Greek meal. Like I'm going to have like cake. I'm going to have coffees. I'm going to have, but I'm not going to go drink, smoke, party, take drugs. I naturally live a healthy lifestyle. That's why people follow me because they trust me and I practice what I preach. I'd like to know what you think is the reason why people follow you. So... The, my brand guidelines, that's why. Yeah, Kayla, because so, they know me. So Kayla is, she's family orientated. Um, this is not an act, by the way. Like I don't want anyone listening to this being like she's just made this whole life up for herself. This is how I live my life. So I love my family. I would, I love them more than anything. How does it come out though in, in your socials, for example? Community. Like I created this community of women because I was so sad. I grew up in this, this bubble and it's stupid of me because I thought every family was like my family. Like my mum, like if people come over, my mum cooks. Like my mum's hospitable. And remember, I, I, for anyone listening to this, I never travelled until the program was released. So I didn't know anything other than the bubble that I grew up in. So my family is full of love, full of kindness, and I thought that everyone's family was like that. And it wasn't until I travelled that people would come up to me crying, being like, I've got no one, like I'm so depressed and it's the only thing that's helped me. I'm like, oh, okay, like what do you mean you've got no one? Like Where's your parents? They're like, oh, they don't live in this country. Like they live in another country and I don't really speak to them. I'm like, oh, 
And then the next person would come. Oh my, like I'm, the lady came up to me, the saddest story ever. And it still haunts me to this day. She had terminally ill, four kids. She was dying. She's like, I've got cancer. This is the only thing that's getting me through. I was like, oh my God. Like story after story after story. These at boot camp meetups. This is the end of the boot camp when you're supposed to be on a high, you're getting story after story after story after story. And I was like, oh my God, not every family is like my family. It's stupid to say now, but like that was my realization. I just wanted to create this community. I wanted everyone to feel like the family. So that's number one. That's why people follow me because I create sense of family for them, a place where they feel safe. Number two, it's women only. So again, not only do they have a community of family, but a place that they feel safe. No offense, but some women yeah. feel not safe. Um, it was the fact that I didn't sexualize myself. So they felt that it was safe for their kids to follow me. There are a lot of mums that follow me. Their kids follow me. I don't drink alcohol, which that's by choice. I just don't like it. It doesn't like the taste. I don't like how it makes me feel. Mothers, again, parents, trust me. Do you, do you let that be known though? Absolutely. Yep. So people know that. And I don't have a reason. Like I wasn't an alcoholic. I, don't, I just don't like the taste. It doesn't fit my lifestyle, so I don't drink it. So then again, mothers with their kids feel safe. Follow Kayla. Follow what she says. I've never been on a diet or refused to diet. I just eat a healthy, balanced diet, Mediterranean food, whatever it is, our Greek food. Um, again, so there's that trust there again. Um, and I maintain a healthy relationship with everyone that I'm around. It's trust. Again, I think people follow me because they just trust that I'm not going to randomly go off and, I don't know, do something out of the line that I that is that I stick to. When you say sexualize, do you mean you're not trying to be, I don't know, some you know fancy model up there with a tight clothes on or something? What does that mean? Sexualize yourself? You won't sexualize yourself. What does there, that mean? There is literally a trend currently right now that that trainers are speaking with their back to the camera, so you're staring at the back of them, their booty, and they're leading their chats with the back of themselves. Okay. Um, like I think that that in a real life situation would be very weird if I was to approach you in tiny shorts and, and walk in backwards and say, hi, Mark, I'm here for you. Walking <laughs> you, backwards, you would that's be for like, sure. You would probably be like, what is going on? Like this is this is so awkward for me. Like so this is how people are leading their stories, their their talks um, to their audiences. Like there's little things I just couldn't do it. Like I – and I, I mean – I'm not going to put myself down, but I'm not exactly the curviest person in the world. So, like, I don't – and I, I don't want to attract a, a male gaze in that way. I don't know if that – I feel like I'm going off topic here, but, like, I no, just – No, no, not actually you're on topic. Yeah, I just feel – I don't know how to say that without putting women down. I don't want to put women down, like, at all. Um, I'm here for women. I to support women. But I think there is certain very obvious images and ways to stand and be and talk um, that are sexual. And I don't support it. Like, it's not for me. But if someone else wants to do it, that's fine. But you, but you think your audience likes it, though? Because I was going to ask you: is there any, is there any a sense, especially from when you were younger, when you're building your audience, is there a sense of naivety about Kayla um, that made it more interesting for me to follow? Because she wasn't somebody who knew what the hell's going on and was actually managing the whole process either sexualizing yourself or not sexualizing yourself in your case, more of a performance, whereas you were just being yourself. Correct. Yeah. Do you think that naivety thing was attractive to a lot of other women who who, who follow you and, and uh, they like naivety? Not naivety but I just normal mean, girl. Like the, the girl next door sort of vibe. Yeah, they did like that. They they And everyone used to say to me, you're from Adelaide? I'm like, yeah. Like, How come you didn't move? I'm like, move where? Like away from my family. If, you, if you're in, I believe, if you are in, you live in a certain lifestyle for a certain amount of time, you adapt to that lifestyle. So if you have millions and millions of followers and you live in Hollywood, and you have millions and millions of dollars and everyone treats you like you're the queen, then you will think that you're the queen. That's great. But then you get used to this lifestyle when it's not there anymore. Who do you have? So I used to say to people, if you lost everything that you had, what would you be? They're like, oh my God, I would die. Like I would hate that. That my, What would I do with my life? Someone said to me one day, and it's on. A, it's been recorded multiple times. Kayla, if you didn't have what you had, what would you be? I was like, oh, I just thought it was the easiest question in the world. I was like, oh, personal trainer. They're like, no, no, no. Like, you lost everything. I'm like, yeah. What would you be? I was like, a personal trainer. Like, I, I genuinely like that. Like, 
I got to wake up every day, be in my pajamas, which no one actually knew, then put sports clothes over the top because it was cold, go outside, train a bunch of girls with music on, loud booming music, make them sweat, boss them around, which is like for me, I was like, this is so fun. Like I get to tell you what to do. Like this is like back in the day when I was like three years old, like I want to be the teacher. Like that's me, but grown up. Um, Get them to transform their mind, transform their body, live their best absolute life, get a hug for it and then appreciate me telling them to do 100 million burpees. I was like, is this a real job? Like, this is the coolest thing in the world. These women are like, thank you so much. I feel amazing. Of course I'm going to be a personal trainer. Like this this idea of being like an influencer that makes millions of dollars by advertising this tea and this camera and this cup, not interested, not for me, never been for me. Would you have been though if you hadn't sold the business? Like just, for, just, never. just to make money? Never, never cared. The amount of times I have been offered millions and millions and millions of dollars to sell skinny teas, protein shakes, things that I just do not believe in, diet pills, anything you can think of. And I've just said blanket, no. Even things that I did want to partner with. I was like, it doesn't, it only benefits me and it doesn't benefit my community. So no, they're like, Kayla, like it's a partnership with this clothing brand. Like that's sports clothing. I'm like, but what does my community get? They're like, nothing. I'm like, do they get like a, even like a discount or like their own? They're like, no. I'm like, okay, then no. I just don't care. So the this, 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 this sweat app now is now called Sweat, not with Kayla, but just called Sweat. And uh, that was acquired by uh, Icon like, Fitness, a, a big organisation, okay? But you're still there. I am. Yeah. So what's your role there now? Personal trainer. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. It is. I, I, but the face. You're still the face. Yes, I'm still yeah. the face, yeah. Um, I create content. I do programming. <laughs> Um, I do stuff with obviously social media. So people, I, I teach people how to do certain exercises and show them certain routines and, and direct them over to sweat. hundred percent. Yeah. Cause sweat I've been following still, you for ages. So. Yeah. Sweat is still standalone. Still standalone. Yeah. yeah. So why didn't you become the CEO or, or the, whatever, like the chairperson or the leader of the pack or whatever? Why didn't you do that? Exactly why I said I love if, – if you gave me any job role, it would still be personal training. Like That is my favourite thing to do. That is not appealing to 99.9% .9 of the audience because you have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. You have to work. Like you've got to mop gym floors and wipe people's like sweat off the mirrors. That's why it's so frustrating for me nowadays that everyone wants to become a personal trainer but they only want to do it online. Have you ever trained a client? No. Like personal training is the most fun job. CEO to me, people coming to – CEO – is a role where I watched the CEO role at Sweat and it's it's Adam Kosh. And, and he's amazing, but all he does is deal with complaints, deal with- Putting out bushfires. Absolutely. Putting out fires every single day at his desk. Like, I don't want to do that. That's not fun. Like to me, I always say, I always joke with Adam and say that he has the boring role. He's like, Kayla, without my role. I said, no, 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 no. But to me, I just don't want to put out fires all day long. And that's what I feel like the CEO does. My role is fun. It's, I get to, be around women, train women, like play loud music in a gym. It's the best job in the world, honestly. Is it is it just fun or is it you're getting feedback all the time? So does Kayla needs the feedback? Does she like to feel what people are experiencing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Every single day, feedback in. We want this. We want that. We feel this. We feel that. And it's me. I, I'm putting out, I guess I'm like a CEO in my own role, like, I'm dealing with like the community. They're sort of like the team members that come into me saying, we need this, we want that, we want that. And I go out, go grab all that information. I still have my own Instagram account, um, the Kale Seems one. And I give it to like a team. This is what they want. This is what they want. This is what they're saying. This is what this person's saying. Um, I wish I could tell you what was coming up because that would be awesome. Actually, can I say what's yeah, coming yeah, up? Yeah, please do. <laughs> I'd, uh, love, I'd love can, to know. Can I say? Yeah, well, yeah cool. cool. <laughs> That'd be really excited. Um, so there was a program that was super famous back in the day that we made called BBG. Yep. And, and what does it stand for? It stands for Bikini Body Guy, yep. which is what we got rid of because nowadays that just is an outdated view of health and fitness and we yep. all know it and it got changed. But it, originally no one ever called it Bikini Body Guy and, we, and I think the news were like Bikini Body Guy, but it was always called BBG. And anyway, we got rid of it, which is what I was really sad about. Um, and it went back into the app, but it went into high intensity. It was called High Intensity with Kayla. Sort of ruins the whole small, you know, BBG, it's ruined the fun out of it. Um, and then it got changed when COVID happened because there was not a, people weren't able to use equipment. So like the whole program sort of got wiped, it got changed and just became a high intensity program. Now from the request of the community, because I'm still online, they were like, can you just bring back the program? Like it was the fittest I've ever been. It was the strongest I've ever been. Mentally, I felt amazing. Like, can you just bring it back? So we're bringing back 
the program, but we're calling it something different. But, and, but can you just explain for me though, what was the program? So what, what's the difference between that, that program and what the people have been using? So what, what are the differentials? So the, differentials? So high intensity in the app is, is like a high intensity program. Yep. It's, it, it is what it is, just high intensity. Whereas the PDFs, BBG, were 28 minute workouts. So seven minute circuits, you do them four times. So seven times yep. four is 28. Um, and they were four women, uh, written by a woman. And it went viral all over the world, just 28 minute workouts, three to four times a week, giving people the most incredible transformations inside and out. It was just amazing. And it brought just a community of women together through boot camps, through meetups, through social media. It was incredible. So you, you got um, seven exercises perhaps? Four, uh, so eight exercises, eight exercises broken up into like circuits like this. So four exercises on this side, if you're watching, four exercises on one side, four exercises on the other. You do this for seven minutes till the timer stops. So keep doing those exercises, this side, this side, this side. So two circuits, and you re- just repeat, and repeat twice. It. Yeah. yeah. And that's all as simple as that. And I used to say to people, they're like, but it's only eight exercises. I was like, yes. But at the end, you, if you add that up, you've done 50 burpees, you've done 70 lunges, like you've done 10 chin-ups, but also like, you know, 100, whatever it is, skips. If you go to a gym now and do that, you stuff around. Like you go to a gym, you lift weights, 10 reps. You might go have a drink, talk to your friend. You go back, you add up your session, you might have done 40 squats. Well done. But with BBG, which is like the OG Kayla program, you'd have done 400. And you wouldn't even know because it's 28 minutes and you just don't stop. It's just such an incredible program. So, so, and the objective, so you do the program, you do the 28 minutes, you're, you're completely you're stuffed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the objective though is to, to get you that body back or is to lose calories or what? It was honestly a program that it just makes you feel incredible. It's like it, it empowers you. You're doing it by yourself. It's the probably one of the hardest programs you'll ever do that you don't think it's going to be hard because you look at it, you're like, it's pink. It's got like a girl cartoon character on the front. Like what the, like, this is going to be easy. Like so many husbands of the, of the women did the program that couldn't get through it. Like, this is impossible. This is so hard. So it's this program that you you finish and you're so proud to share. And it was this sort of viral, you finish and you're like, I almost died, but like I did it. And then you're you're more inclined to share it. So it gave women a challenge, something that they said, I can't do it, turned into I can do it. And that's what I loved. So empowering empowering women. Yeah, to through fitness. To, to do something like that. Yeah. It was, was a never, big deal. Yeah, and it was never about calories. It was never about any of that stuff. It was nothing. And that's why people loved it because it wasn't that fad. And that was another one of my guidelines it was never going to be a fad nothing I ever did was a fad like a diet pill nothing I was sick of that stuff I was so sick of seeing it I was so sick of people comparing themselves to okay so right rewind 10 years ago so sick of people comparing themselves to celebrities it was always the celebrity diet those celebrities has trainers those trainers were athletes but no one looked at the trainers the athletes they looked at the celebrity and what they were doing which was a lie anyway we all know that a PR team writes some celebrity diet the celebrity doesn't sit there and go this is exactly what I eat in a day and it was it was false People used to follow it like a Bible, hated it. I was like, liar. Then I hated the lose 10 kilos in 10, what? Stop. Like that's not real either. Like why doesn't, and that's when I looked at my family, I'm like, why doesn't everyone just eat, like use food as a celebration? And that was another thing I worked out, which is I'm going back and forth, back and forth. When I traveled, people use food as like a punishment. I was like, what is going on? They, they would diet, they would cut out, they would restrict foods, they would be scared of food. I was like, no. In Greek culture, we use food as celebration. We use food to bring people together. This was like such a weird foreign thing to me. So BBG was this program that said, don't really worry about that, just train really hard. And women loved it. They're like, great. They're like, can I eat this? I'm like, yes. <laughs> and how important simplicity because like 28 minutes, that's not a long time. So like most people think, oh, I've got to train for an hour. I've got to train for 45 minutes or whatever the case may be or even longer. Um, or I've got to run for an hour. That sounds pretty cool, just 28 minutes and gets me to where I want to get to. That, that was that was the line. That was the that was the hook. That was, was the one that, that they loved. I'm sorry, but like if you're not a person who understands the fact that like it takes 20 minutes at least, to get your kids into a car, to get them then to drive 20 minutes to the gym, to then put them into a crèche, make them stay there, stay there, stay in the gym, stay, in, stay, stay, just stay there, just stay there. Mummy's going to go work out. Go and work out. Say you do a 28-minute workout. Get your kids. Get out of the crèche. Come on, we're going to leave. We're going to leave. We're going to leave. That's another 10 minutes. And then you're back home 20 minutes. That's an hour and a bit more to try and get to the freaking gym. 
Imagine in the comfort of your home, you do the workout for 28 minutes. And hearing it's just 28 minutes was so satisfying. If you want to run for an hour, run. You want to do a 45 minute workout? Do that. If you're an athlete, you're obviously going to train more. But these people weren't athletes. These were just women that want to do a damn workout in their own home. That's what they did. It's funny, Jeff Fennick once told me, the, the Australian boxer, and uh, you know, he's a Sydney guy, maybe you don't know him, but he told me once when you're training to prepare for a fight, he said to me that a lot of the guys and girls um, used to think they have to train for an hour and a half, two hours a day. He said if you train with me, him, for 35 minutes, he said you'll get everything you need yeah. to be able to jump in the ring and, and, and you know, fight a fight for around 30 minutes. He said you don't need to do those long two or three sessions a day and all that other stuff. And he said, but it's about intensity yeah. in that 35 minutes. Absolutely. And I did it with him. And it's true. Like, uh, in fact, after 35 minutes, I couldn't, I could hardly move. You know, I was just begging to, for the 35 minutes <laughs> to finish. I want to go home. And, uh, and, and I think that's a good point because for me, it, it's about efficiency. Um, I don't want to have to do all those other things. I mean, I didn't have little kids or anything like that, but just traveling to a gym, hanging out in the gym, you know, like doing your stuff and then you had to wait for people, things to become available because someone's using that over there or someone's using that over there. There's a lot of convenience associated with this. Is that a, um, a is that geared towards busy people, either mothers or just busy people generally? Are, are you trying to send this message to busy people? Just, My 28 minutes is better, more efficient. Everyone's busy though. Yeah. Like it's not just busy people, like an hour for a workout in a day is a long time. An hour and a half is even a longer time, obviously. 28 minutes was just so appealing to everyone. I wasn't like only busy people, only people with a job, only mums. It wasn't. There was this huge, I think we had to, I think at the time it was like we had to legally put an age bracket. So we're just like 18 to 50. I, I, I can't even remember what we wrote, but that would just opened up this like audience and it was just, who is this for? People used to say to me in interviews back in the day, who is this program for? And I would say anyone, any woman, anyone that wants to work out fast, get it done, feel empowered, feel inspired in the comfort of their own home, in the gym, in the park, wherever they want it, it is literally for everyone. Now that I say that, I take a step back, it's not for everyone. It's a hard advanced program. If you are willing to get out of your comfort zone, it will get you out of your comfort zone. But is it for someone with an injury? No. But what about if I can only do 24 minutes? What about if I actually clag? Great, do it. Yeah. yeah. So it's in other words, don't count myself out. Don't go, oh, shit, I can't do 28 minutes. But if I can do 24 minutes, it's good. Absolutely. The thing is like, and you'll never do the 24 minutes, you do the 28. You know what I used to say to people? I used to say to my clients, I used to train out of my parents' backyard and they used to say to me, I'm not coming to training today. Send me a text. I say, why? And they say, I can't be bothered. I said, okay, cool. <laughs> I know you can't. But what I want you to do is you don't have to train. You have to come. You have to touch the door. Show me your face, go. Just touch the door. Do nothing else. So you used to come every single time, 99.9% of the time. They used to touch the door. I used to look at them and they're like, all right, I'll train. The hardest part is actually getting there. Once you're there, you'll get it done. You'll never do 24 minutes of a 28-minute program. You'll do the 28, 100%, unless you need to go off and like, I don't know, vomit or something, like throw up outside. Like if anything stops you, like other than that, you're not going to go, i got four minutes to go, nah, I might call it. You're going to do it. It's 28 so minutes. So Kayla's, you know, you've, you've had some great successes, as I said earlier on, and you've got, you know, you're still working on sweat, you're, you're still the face of sweat, you're, and you're running your own, your own personal social pro programs as well. Where's Kayla now in her personal life? So, uh, yeah, yeah, and Papa's still alive? Yeah, yeah, yep. Papa's still alive. Um, Mum and Dad are good? Yeah. Um, you've got two children? Yeah. You know, um, you've got your four, how old's your daughter, your first four. child? Four. She's four. Yeah. How old's your next child? He's, he is, his name is Jax. He's five months old. Yeah, he's, you've only just had him. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, I don't know how, how you're supposed to say that. But anyway, you've just had uh, Jax a little while ago, a, a new partner. Yeah. you got a new partner. Jay. It's Jay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh. I read somewhere that a whole lot of your family live in the same sort of vicinity or the same street or I'm I not even kidding. Within three, three streets is every single person of my family. Yeah, so you're all sort of, you, yeah. you, you own the neighbourhood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make them really sad because I'm thinking of moving for a little bit, moving states for a little bit. So I'm Moving in a state? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. just to check some stuff out. Yeah. So how's your life now? Like uh, we just, I mean, to me it looks like it's perfect. It but is. like how are you feeling? <laughs> I feel incredible. I'm so truly happy in everything. It's and I'm very lucky and I 
I appreciate every second that I have with my yamba or my parents. Like the other day I walked into, I have a room in my house called the playroom. Um, most parents have a playroom. It's just a messy room with toys. Um, and I was watching all the kids play and I was like, I'm so lucky. I went to my grandparents' house. I bought them a new table and chairs. Their table and chairs were zip tied together. I was like, come on, guys. So I bought them a new table and chairs. I sat down, the new tables and chairs. They ordered more chairs for it because they got so excited. But I was like, I'm so lucky. Like, it's just I have everything and I'm truly happy. And it's really bad because when people get to this this point in their life, they wait for something to go like catastrophically wrong because they're like, this can't be what it is. But I'm just learning to just enjoy the moment, be present with my happiness because right now everything's all good. One time I remember I was playing golf with Jerry Harvey and his, his son, John, and John was about probably about 13 at the time. I was playing with my son who was the same age as John at the time. We're playing golf and uh, I'm not a golfer. Just Jerry, I had dinner with Jerry the night before and uh, I paid for dinner for him and Katie and he said, look, I'll, I want to return the blah, blah, blah and I'll pay for golf to pl- pay for you to play golf tomorrow. Anyway, I just did it out of, I don't know, courtesy and all sort of stuff anyway. But I remember walking down from the one of the tee off areas, walking down the hill and uh, Jerry said to me, I said, mate, how do you feel like, you know, like you're a billionaire, you come from nothing, you've done so well, blah, blah, He said, um, I, Mark, to be honest with you, I never feel like I'm going to keep it. I always worry that someone's going to take it away from me, that I don't really deserve it. And uh, I don't know what exactly, I have the same feeling. Um, do you ever get those feelings that you don't deserve all these things that you have now or and it's all, somehow it's going to, turn around and bite you on the butt and uh, <laughs> something's going to go wrong because it is perfect. It sounds like it's perfect. You look yeah. really happy and relaxed, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay? Do you ever get worried that something's going to ha- turn around and not go so well? I, yes and no. Like I had a beautiful upbringing. Like I cannot even remember a day in my upbringing. One time, one memory in my whole upbringing that I remember, and I'll just tell you really quickly so my mum listening. I was walking to school and my mum kept trying to say to me, you need to clean your room. And it was my birthday. And I said to my mum, I don't want to clean my room. Stop making me clean my room. I want to go to school. She was like, clean your room. I was like, stop it. Why are you doing this on my birthday? And anyway, I was walking to school and she's pulled up beside me because I was like, I'm walking to school. She's like, get in the car. I was like, no, mom, you're ruining my birthday. She's like, well, you're ruining my whole life. It just came out of her mouth. And I was like, oh. <laughs> anyway, turns out she was trying to stop me from going to school because it was a surprise, like surprise, like at school walking in. And that was the one, one time and one time only that I remember a bad memory from my childhood. And my mom immediately, after they said surprise, my mom ran to the school and hugged me. She's like, I'm so sorry. So like I had a great childhood. And then I'll be honest, like, the last seven years that the whole rise of Kayla was really hard. Like I was battling with, you know, having this amazing upbringing, not being anyone to suddenly having my face, you know, in the media, um, having friends who I thought were my friends, you know, say things like, you know, you could just pay off our whole house now. I was like, what? Or like, you should buy us all cars. I'm like, why? Like, I, and I'm thinking like, these people aren't my friends or like, you should stop now or like watching them, you know, make a comment on a Facebook group that someone would say something negative about me and then them commenting. I'm like, oh my God, this is like really hard. And then I felt like, you know, honestly, and I've said this honestly, that although Toby is fantastic, you know, at what he does, like I said, cool, calm and collected, perhaps we weren't as suited to each other as we should be. Um, so that was really hard. I battled with that. And um, it wasn't till just recently now from, you know, I feel like it's been seven or eight years that I felt truly happy where I am. Like I look at Jay and I like, I smile, my heart warms. And that wasn't what happened like, over, you know, the last however Probably many years. That. And I feel that, I feel that, and this is no dig at Toby. Like I feel like he would have felt very much the same. Um, and you're both were very young anyway, very young. And and you've interviewed Toby yeah, before yeah. and he is very, you know, he knows exactly what he wants. He has this plan for his life and, and he's very structured, very, very structured, very and, and I, and, and I, you know, I go, I do that, you know, I would have done that as well like, to explain um, that, like the, the level of talking. But I live a life where like Jay is very carefree. Like he'll do something hilarious, like funny. Um, it's amazing with Anna. It's not scared to like break the rules a little bit and like do silly things, um, which I love. Like I love so much about him. So I feel truly right now, truly happy. And I feel that I deserve it. 
Like I look at my family, I look at how they all live in the same neighborhood. I look at our family dinners and it feels right. It feels like everyone's connected and I smile and I sit there and there's this sense of warm that comes over me, which I haven't felt since I was a kid. And it was that sense of family, that sense of connection, that, that thing that I was missing. Um, and you try and fill these voids with like dogs, like, you know what I mean? You try and fill this love with like dogs and, and whatever. And yeah, it's not till now that I really felt that warmth that I feel, yeah, that I deserve. And I don't feel like it's going anywhere. And is that a reason why? Because I very rarely ever saw an interview with you in the past five or six years, very rarely, but I have seen a little bit more, more recently. And in fact, here, are, here, here you are on this podcast and uh, I saw an article in the AFR more recently and uh, is it all of a sudden Kayla now prepared to do interviews whereas before she was a little bit reticent to do that? Is it now because prepared to present herself outside of that controlled regime? What's uh, that? What is that about? That um, I find it really hard answering this. I think that for a long time it was just um, how do I do this? Every time I do, every time I say something, that little portion of what I say gets taken and blown out of context. So if I say, Toby and I don't really align, that becomes me bitter, she's angry, she's this, she's not at all. That's just facts. Now, if I had said that and we were in a relationship, so if, I, if I'm in a relationship with you and I say, we're, we're kind of the opposite, that's that's a love story. Opposites attract, amazing, but, but when we're apart, that's me bitter because I'm a female and I'm emotional and I'm bitter. Not, not at all. Like, it's just facts, like logical facts. We don't align. So um, I was hesitant to say anything. The, the second I did, look what happened. They made a, wrote, a, wrote a small article about that little portion, which was nothing to do with business, with nothing to do with me being empowered, with nothing to do with how good is, you know, what Kayla's done. Nothing. It had to be that. So I, I'm reluctant to and reserved when it comes to those types of conversations and those, and then that's why I'm still not, I'm going around, as you can see, I'm going around and around. I'm not answering your question. Um, and I've always felt like I work with a team and I feel like if I go and stand up and say, oh, I did this and I do that. I hate when people do that. Cause I'm like, there was a whole team that helped. And I don't want my team watching my interviews being like, Hey, like we did that. We filmed that like together. Um, so that's why I don't go and say, oh, I did this and I did that. But, you, but you're feeling more, Empowered. So I still or, don't do it. You still don't do it. It was my one, like, it's my one thing. I'm still telling you now, like, there's a team there. There's yeah. help there. And, and you know what? It's really hard because you're a female and female, there's this big, like, you know, push for females to stand up and say, I'm the boss. I'm the CEO. Like, I've run a company. I do this. I do that. And you all go, wow, amazing. She's a, she's a boss. She's a queen. She's the, but like, I'm not like that. I'm happy. And it puts me in a position of weakness in other people's eyes. Cause they're like, oh, you had help. I'm like, yeah. That dude over there that runs that company, he also has help. But it's just how you say it. Like, I'm happy to say I have help. I'm happy to say I work with the team. I'm happy to say that I should probably be reporting to D at Sweat than her reporting to me. Like, I'm happy to say that. I don't know why there's this big thing about being this boss woman. Like, I just work well with the team. So you, you're, and what you, I think what you're saying, to, like, and I often think about this myself, I mean, success is always built upon the broad shoulders of others. I don't give a damn who you are. Donald Trump or whoever, I mean, I don't give a damn who you are. <laughs> Success is always built up on the broad shoulders of others. But you, what you're also saying is that it's important to understand your own vulnerabilities or your weaknesses and that others will fill that fill that void. I mean, you even just said it about Toby. Like you said that he filled a void when thing went, things went a, bit, a little bit south when the, the app first went up. Absolutely. And uh, he's calm, cool, collected sort of personality, allowed it sort of to, you know, filter back down to your staff and everybody else have the confidence that everything's going to be okay. Yeah. And so it got fixed. Logical, non-emotional. Yeah, yeah, non-emotional. <laughs> like, that's do fair. it. Yeah. And, that, and, that, and that's great. And that works in that role. Hence why you're the CEO. Hmm. You're going to put Toby, no offence, Toby, like you're not going to put him on a stage filled with emotions, doing training at boot camp with women screaming and loving and hugging. That's just not him. Probably that was him me. <laughs> like that's right. And I'm like not sure he looked that good in a crop top and little shorts, but like that was where I sat. And it's not, it doesn't sit like that. It sits like that. And the, it sat like that and it did so well and it went like that. And that's what makes successful business. Your two CEOs or the two people, not two CEOs, but the two mates that run the company together like 
It's yin got to yang. sit like that. Yin and yang. One has got to be good in one area. One's got to be good. The best thing about us was that we didn't step on each other's toes. I'm not trying to be you. You're not trying to be me. Up, 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 up. Still up, 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 up. You know what I mean? If you try and step on that person's toes, you're going that way. And that and that's what we didn't do. Um, and that's why the business was so successful. But people view it like that. Oh, you're creative? Oh, you ran boot camps only? Oh, you're a personal trainer? Oh, you're the CEO. The only reason I would take the CEO position to say, I'm the CEO. That's the only reason. That's the only thing it would do to me in my head and maybe to a few suits. But otherwise, I'm fine. Yeah, I mean, I, do, I just think the whole CEO thing is a bit of a nonsense, to be honest with you. Like, it doesn't make much sense to me. Chief executive officer, I don't know why he, he or she's the chief in charge of an executive officer. It just sounds like um, head, head administrator <laughs> to me to some extent. Like, that's how it seems. Like, and because you've got to have someone who's um, plugging the gaps, that, that's important. Um, but that's more an administrative role. Yeah. Um, and then there was expertise roles within the business. So, I mean, I agree with you but in terms of the CEO's sort of nomenclature. I mean, it's a bit of a thing we, we're, we're stuck with because that's how we're educated. That's how we've been been taught to look at how companies are run. It might be different at BHP or, um, you know, the bank, Westpac or something like that. But I think in businesses like what we have, what you had, is it's a different sort of environment. And and in your case now, the CEO probably more likely a better representative of the new shareholder. It's the new shareholder can talk to the new CEO and uh, tell the new CEO what they want to see in terms of returns and all that sort of stuff. And it, it, that's a really interesting um like analysis that you just provided, particularly, and I think you and Toby, I mean, knowing him as I do, not perfectly well, but I just know him, I have interviewed him a few times, um, that he is a very structured thinker Absolutely. and, and uh, very good at that. But yeah. I also think my gut feeling is he accepts what he's strong at and what he's not strong at too. That's what I think from I've never asked him, but that's what I think. And now speaking to you, I can sort of see why it did go so well because to some extent you're, nearly opposites mm -hmm. in some regards. Um, and But that but that's what the business needed. That's what your business needed. That's yeah, what your correct. audience wanted to see. And they, he sat behind the scenes all the time. Yeah. It wasn't, uh, you know, sweat with Toby or mm. sweat with Carla and Toby. It wasn't that. And you need that preparedness. Yeah. You need someone who's prepared to accept that. Yeah. And I think there was a big reason and a big level of respect there that and I think this was a big pain point for, and I will speak, you know, on behalf of Toby, um, that growing up together through this business, it was particularly hard for him to be behind the scenes and see something that he had built grow. And it was Kayla at Zinners. And again, there's where it comes to the opposite, where it's Kayla at Zinners doing so well, Kayla at Zinners, Kayla at Zinners, Kayla, da, 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 da. and he's just sitting there going, I have absolutely no recognition. So when it came to podcasts, when it came to interviews, when it came to business, I always put Toby forward. I said, you go. You go, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be me. It need, it, it, let it be you. Let, let you have your voice because this is your strong suit. This is what you're good at. This is what you've built. This is what you should be recognized for. Like, And that was a level of respect there. So that's why I never got interviewed about it. I would never sit with you, no offense, back in the day because there was this level of like I would put Toby forward. You speak to Toby. Oh, no, no, no. But back in the day, I don't want to speak to Toby. I want to speak to you. You're the face. You're the one that's going to get us a click. So I'm like, no, but this is his strong suit. You want a boot camp? You want creative, you want film, like it's not, again, puts me there, like when I, as I say it, but you want that, let me be that for you. Let me give you an interview about personal training. Let me train you, but you want business analytics, you want numbers, you want this, you want growth. You speak to me. That's, I mean, that's how it works. That's very clever. I, I, it's nearly like you step back from the business. Like, I don't know, it's nearly like you can set yourself back and step outside of everything. And actually have a look at it, like look at it objectively, look at everything that's going on in the business objectively. You're, it looks like you're able to remove yourself from the business. Kayla can remove herself from the business and just have a look at everything, the whole everyone wrestling in the mud and all the sort of stuff that's going on and just see and and take the view where she fits in. Um, that's a pretty uh, mature thing for a, at the time when you were much younger, you were in your 20s, mm. you were doing it. Did you know if you're doing that consciously or was that just your instinct? Um, I don't know. Uh, I guess it must have been just instinct. And I think very, some very, um, honest and real conversations with Toby saying, Hey, and I, and I, I, let me tell you, and I, again, I'll speak to Toby. He's grown up a lot. So his conversations back then would have been like, I'm not coming to the interview. I don't feel respected. Whereas now would be, 
I'll speak to the interview because that is what, like he, he, the way you would have watched him grow over, the, mm. f- over many years and the way that he speaks and presents. Um, so I think uh, it was a little bit like, again, I think this would be taken out of context, but I was a bit scared to the upset, you know, my partner yeah. out of respect. So I would always do that, like, you know, people pleasing. You go, you go, do, you go do it. And then as I grew up and he grew up, we both realised where we were meant to be. Um, yeah, it was. I think it's very mature. Is, and where my final question to you is, what's the go forward for Kyle Lucinus? Like what's what happens for me? I mean, apart from relaunching, you know, your 28 minutes, but where to from there? I mean, or do you just live the day by day and just live your life or do you actually set up a plan next five years? Well, I'm still at sweat for probably the next five years um, and I want to concentrate on that. I think that my biggest mistake through this whole thing is not celebrating where I am, never always looking forward. And I guess that's great. And that's what makes you successful because you always have a plan. You always have a goal. You have something to reach. But if you never celebrate where you are, you will never be happy. And so the fact that now that I am now present, I'm now celebrating where I am. I'm now appreciating my family, where I live, what I have has made me so happy. So when people ask me questions like, where will you be in 10 years? I get instantly nervous. I get instant anxiety because I'm like, I don't really want to think about that. I know I should, but like right now, let me just enjoy the present moment because I will never celebrate where I am. And that's what I never did through my whole career. That's a ripping answer. <laughs> thanks. It really is. Thanks. And thanks for taking the time to see me. Thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> you too. <laughs>